Okay, now let us read point number three together. Let us read point number three. Are you there? Reading. Church censures are necessary for the reclaiming and gaining of the offending brethren, for deterring of others from the like offences, for purging out of that leaven which might infect the whole lump, for vindicating the honour of Christ and the holy profession of the gospel, and for preventing the wrath of God which might justly fall upon the church, if they should suffer his covenant and the seals thereof to be profaned by notorious and obstinate offenders. Let us turn to God in prayer. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for keeping us safe through the week, bringing us into thy house once again. Lord, we pray that you be merciful to cleanse us and wash us of all our sins. And Lord, now also to remove all tiredness and distraction, that we may be able to concentrate and understand this very important topic for thy church. And Lord, we pray that you would use these lessons to strengthen the foundation and build unity and build um, robustness in thy church. We pray for every group meeting tonight. May thou be with them. Use thy word, O Lord, to strengthen and feed your children. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we will continue tonight. Now, church censures. Censures are formal rebukes. Formal statements issued to judge the sin of someone and to deal with sin. All right, so there is judgment involved and it is a severe reprimand. So these are church censures. I said from the beginning, it is something that is very alien to many churches today. If you join us from other churches, you may not even imagine that church would even talk about disciplining members. The concept of disciplining people is something that, that is very, very um, um, disliked and shunned in the secular world. And in church, we talk about discipline, church discipline. How can church discipline people? Church must be loving, caring, forgiving. How do we answer that? Well, we know for sure. We've seen thus far in scriptures over and over again. And we've looked at it from point one, two, and three. God puts authority in churches that you cannot run away from. Just like God put authority in countries, we studied earlier on, God put authorities in churches. And why does he do that? One of the reasons are the officers of the church are to care for the church, protect the church. And we saw in verse 3 that the Bible is full of examples in the Old and the New Testament where discipline is executed. So, discipline is a biblical concept in church. I hope that we do not forget that. And discipline is meant to achieve these purposes in point number three. Right? I said there are five purposes. Let us quickly make sure we don't forget. What are the five purposes? We, we saw the verses in the Bible. The Bible shows us that when the church exercises church discipline and exercises correctly, and the people respond correctly, it is very, very beneficial. It is not an evil thing at all. God implemented it for this reason. So we saw examples. Number one, point number three. What are the reasons? All right. Now, in fact, you can answer... Um, Question number 11, all right? You may as well write it down. Actually, you don't need to write it. It's in, your, it's in point three, all right? Just remember, I say summarize the reasons for church censures. There are five here. Number one, reclaiming and gaining the offending brethren. The brethren have offended God, sinned against God grievously. So we need to discipline. It helps him to come back. We saw that in the Bible, reclaim the brethren. So it is very important. Parents do that for their children. Number two, deter others from like offences. If the person don't repent, or even if the person repent, because there is discipline, the rest will fear. We saw, the Bible says, the church was filled with great fear, mega fear. So fear is good. It prevents others from sinning the same sin. Like parents, when you, when you discipline your, your one child, you also want the other child to know. If you do that, you will also be disciplined. So there is fear. So it is good for 
the person and it is important for the church others won't sin the same sin and furthermore number three for purging out of that leaven that might infect the whole lump sin will spread if we don't discipline in other words don't stop the sin it will spread in the church and then the church will be destroyed so we saw that in the bible as well number four for vindicating the honor of christ that is what is what we are going to learn tonight and for preventing the wrath of god two more things we got to learn from the bible that god says discipline because it's important for the name of christ god said discipline because it prevents god from disciplining us when god steps into discipline it is going to be very very scary all right so let's continue now <clears throat> um, let's do 10 b3 first all right so we, we did not finish this previously now give bible reasons for church censure in each case the spread of sin in the church the spread of sin in the church we read that verse a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump that chapter was specifically all right let's turn to first corinthians chapter 5 please know this in the classic chapter of church discipline now every time i ask you does the bible have any examples of church discipline the classic one that you cannot forget there are many examples we covered but the one that you can very quickly refer to first corinthians chapter 5 know that here now it says Paul says, verse, verse 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan, for the destruction of the flesh and the spirit, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul says, please discipline this person. He is committing fornication. All right? Immorality of... Um, sexual relationship with his with his most likely his um, stepmother in the family so it's a discipline now verse 7 god tells us now perch out out from where perch out therefore verse 7 that o leaven that you may be a new lump and it reminds us that in verse 6 a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump it will spread this verse must be understood this way this verse must be understood like a baker baking a cake the yeast in there will definitely cause the cake to rise it will rise in other words we don't exercise church, church discipline god says it will spread that sin will spread besides that sin other sins will spread now but look at verse 7 perch out perch out get read out out of where out of the church out of the church because if you look in verse 2 this deed might be taken away from among you it is getting the deed and if the person won't rep repent then get the person also out of the church verse 5 so it must be removed from the church so examples of how will it spread in the church we covered some of those so now i want to ask you what are the reasons for example a church leader or fellowship leader now if this person commits certain sin won't repent continue to to uphold that sin argue about it now if a person commits sin especially if it's a church leader how will it spread in the church Sherlyn, how will it spread say ah no it's just his personal life come on church it's people's personal life say again other people will also think it is fine if you do not discipline if the church does not act if the church does not act how to act we, we will study later on right the five steps then for example if i were a fellowship leader all right and I live a sinful life or, or I say I want to marry an unbeliever I'm going to marry an unbeliever I hope you, you know that the believers should not marry unbelievers it's clearly stated in the Bible um, 
Yep, just two chapters away, chapter 7. Right, marriage is always in the Lord. Chapter 7, verse 39. If a person wants to remarry, for example, because the husband died, for example, in verse 39, she can marry whom she ever she will, but only in the Lord. So the Christian must only marry in the Lord, means only marry believers. So I'm a fellowship lead. All right? And then my wife dies. And then I remarry. But I remarry outside the Lord, an unbeliever. What will happen? People in the fellowship and the church doesn't do anything. I blatantly go against the word of God and the church, hey, don't, don't. Because, don't do anything. Because he's a very good Bible teacher. The people like him. Or we have no one else to depend on. So let's just, just, just overlook it. Let's not exercise discipline. What will happen? The young people in the group, well, if the fellowship lead marries an unbeliever, then I guess it's fine with me. If the fellowship lead comes in low-cut blouses, you know, no, men don't come in low-cut blouses, right? come in indecent, indecent attire and all that, and you're, you're a lead in something in church, and the church doesn't do anything, then everyone else will say, I guess that by that standard, there is nothing wrong, right? So I think it's very well put. People will think there is nothing wrong, although the Bible says it's wrong. So that is how it will spread. How else will it spread? Now I know a church, they exercised church discipline recently and people left the church. It is very sad. I want to say that church discipline, as we have studied so far, is meant to strengthen the church. It's meant to help the church deal with sin. But sadly, people don't understand. Church discipline is meant to unite and make the church stronger. And when, if one day God does ordain that we will have church discipline, you must remember that. We ask some questions after that. How to make sure we understand that? How will it spread? How else will it spread? Now, if, if as a church leader, my child chooses to marry an unbeliever or a Roman Catholic, is not in the Lord. Right? And as a church leader, I go, should I go or should I not go for the wedding? Pay. We studied before. No. Why not? By going, you are saying it is okay. Because by being there is to sanction that I'm here to support the wedding. Unless it's Howard, huh? remember Howard say? I will go, yes, I will go. I'll put up my hand and say, I disagree with the wedding. That's different, right? But if you go, it's sanctioning. You will walk your daughter down the aisle, right? Here, I give you to an unbeliever, although the Lord says marry only in the Lord, but I'm giving you to the unbeliever, correct? Same for the wedding, for the dinner. It's a celebration of the wedding. That is what is the dinner for, right? It's a celebration of the, of the marriage. So if the elder or the church leader decides to go. Should, should the church do anything? If the church don't do anything, then people will say, I guess it's fine to marry an unbeliever. I guess it's fine to be there. I guess it's fine to support this. Correct? Now, this is a very common thing that happens in church. And I pray that it will not come to the state in our church. Because every single church that I know that had to take a stand on this, has caused session to split, has caused people to leave church. But you must understand, is it a wicked and unpleasant thing to do? Marriage is a happy thing. Is it unpleasant? Please know that God says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, unless we think we are cleverer than God, and unless we think sin is not sinful. But there are other things that will occur if the church don't deal with it. We're going to study. All right, so these are some examples. People will just say, it is fine. It is fine. If I'm a church fellowship leader and I live carnal lives, I live a carnal life, worldly life, and I promote my worldliness, my carnality, hmm? 
by being, being part of things that I should not be part of in the world. And then the church doesn't do anything. Actually, what will happen? If just say, I'm a church leader, I'm not a full-time worker, right? Maybe I'm a, okay, um, a working person and then I'm a, I'm, I'm a church leader. And then I'm part of things outside in the world which, which are carnal and boldly. And the church doesn't do anything. And I lead young people. Terry, what will happen? I call you all not to, no need to be upset so that I can ask your questions. So the young people will not follow what the church leaders do? The young people will follow what the church leaders do. Remember we studied about sheep, right? Sheep just follow. It will spread. Alright, so some of this. Please know it is very important. Yes, Douglas. Mm. Members marrying non-Christians? That is correct. Okay, and uh, most likely before the wedding uh, ever takes place, there will be a kind of courtship. Mm. So the member courting non Christian, during that time, does the church actually exercise church discipline? Okay, so the question is so before the person gets married, there will be this courtship period, right? So for a Christian in church, they're going through a courtship with an unbeliever before marrying. Would the church exercise church discipline? The church will, because being in a relationship to marry someone in courtship that is not a believer, it's already intending to commit the ultimate unequal yoke. But in that relationship, it's already unequal yoke. So we, the church will begin to counsel. What are the steps we talk after? The church must begin to act then. All right, not just keep quiet, keep quiet, quiet. Let's watch. Let's watch and let's watch. Good, Mary, let's, let's now excommunicate the guy. So, yes, you're right. It, there will be these steps that occur throughout. Yeah. All right. Again, remember, the steps, there are steps that graduate. We, we see afterwards. This, every step of the discipline is to recover the brethren. Remember, that's the purpose. That is why we don't wait till the person gets married. Throughout, we are trying to recover the brethren all the time. Okay? Now, Yep, so thanks for the question. Now, next one. Next thing that God says, discipline. Discipline. The Westminster Divine rightly pointed out the, the, fourth, the fourth reason. For vindicating the honour of Christ. For vindicating the honour of Christ. Please know that that is one of the reasons. Now, anyone can think of a Bible verse or Bible verses that tells us if you don't do the, if you don't deal with sin and it's not dealt with the name of Christ will be shamed anyone because it must be a biblical principle right all right what about David remember David committed adultery hmm? and what did God say to David Let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel <coughs> chapter 12. Let us see how God views sin committed and dealt with. What does God how does God view that? Chapter 12 verse 14. Now let's actually um, read verses 13 to 14 together, reading. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord hath also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Do you know what God is saying? God is saying, you have committed this sin and if I don't deal with it, how did God deal with it? What was God going to do? The verse tells you. It says, because by this deed you have given the enemies of the Lord to bless him, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely 
means don't don't try to bargain with God anymore. God have decided he the child will definitely die. Who is doing the disciplining? Howard. God himself. Nathan say God says that this child will surely die. Who can kill the child? Nathan didn't come and take step step the child. How did the child die? The child died because the child died. God took the child home. It was an act of discipline from God himself. And why did God do that? How does God view the need to discipline? And he acted himself. He say, the reason why I do this is because by this deed of, of adultery, you have given great occasion, great opportunity to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. What is blaspheme? Blaspheme means for people to say things about God and his character and his truth and to deride it, to despise it, to make fun of it, to abuse it. He said, David, do you know when you do this, the unbeliever will say, Oh, the Christian king of the nation that belongs to God, who call themselves the holy nation because they belong to the holy God. Look what the appointed holy nation's king did. The people will say that. They say, my name is so important that they will know, oh, this God is really holy. How is this God known to be holy? Leah, how would the people know, oh, kill the baby, if God is holy? How would they know? Why would the act of discipline make people think that this God is holy? Say again. He will not tolerate sin even if it is the king that he appointed himself. He will also deal with him in this very painful way. So God says, God shows the nation, I am no respecter of persons. And Christians, we should learn that. You may be a church leader, I may be a church leader, and you may be a father, you may be head of the home. But God is no respecter of persons. That's the only way God can show the people, I am a holy God. The name of Christ is so important when the church does not do it, does not discipline. Then we tell the world, we will protect our own. We will protect our own. We will tell the world, sin is nothing. Although the Bible says these are sin, we will just ignore our God and do what we want to do and allow what we want to allow in church. It's nothing. We make a mockery about who God is and His commandments. Understand that. So the church must deal with sin. That is the reason, another reason. Now we sang the hymn just now. More love to thee, O Christ. We must love Christ, his honour. The, how the world view him, his glory, his holiness, his justice, his righteousness. We must view that as so important to the name of Christ that we will not regard relationships, personal preferences. We will do what we need to do to make sure we deal with sin. Understand that. We want people to repent because of that. <clears throat> we want people to turn away from sin in discipline because of that. That when men turn away from sin, they are saying, this God that I worship, He tells me not to do this. I've done it. I repent. I turn away from it now. And just like, and the church will deal with my sin. That is what it is. More love to thee, O Christ. The church discipline at the bottom line of everything. My friend, understand this. It is about vindicating the honour of Christ. If you don't love Christ, you only love your friends. You love your friendships. You love your children. You love your parents more than Christ's honour. Then you will just cover one eyes and, and not deal with sin. Church will fail God. So please remember it's about a love towards Christ. Now, 
Other examples, can you think of another example? In the Old Testament, Moses. Uh, tonight we have a lot of things to cover, so you're spared off these long questions. Now, Moses, what did Moses do? Uh, Mabel, what did God say to Moses? What did Moses do and then God says, not using you anymore. You cannot enter the promised land. Don't know. Alright, Numbers 20. So after tonight you'll know. Numbers chapter 20. Please know how God views His honour. When we sin and don't deal with it, His honour is at stake. Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. The problem is, if I don't ask questions, I know you fall asleep. Numbers chapter 20, verses 11 to 12. Because you know I'm, I'm not going to ask, you're, not, you're just going to doze off. 11 to 12. Let's read together. And Moses lift up, lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. What did God just do? God just exercised discipline. The discipline was you too, although you have been leading the people so far, you've suffered so much, you've contributed so much, you've done so much and, and tolerated so much. And I told you all that you all will bring them in. But because Moses, you did not sanctify me. You're not going in. You and Aaron. What does sanctify mean? Um, Benedict, what does sanctify mean? Uh, Benedict, sanctify, what does sanctify mean? Honor, um, that's fear. Uh, ben, the other Ben. Say again. Set apart, set apart. make holy. Alright, please remember this concept. Sanctify means to set apart for God. When Moses did not obey what God said, he, Moses did it his own way. God said, you did not set me apart. Why? Ben, 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 why? Why did God say, hey, hello? What you did, you did not set me apart. He didn't obey, and why must God deal with it? If God didn't deal with it, then? Then it shows that I don't have to follow God. You know, once in a while, I just decide, the Bible says, God says this, but you know, once in a while, I can choose to do what I want to do. And God says, now, if I don't deal with you, then when the people enter the land, what are they going to do? I give them the commandments, the Ten Commandments. You know, I think once in a while, we can drop four, we can drop five. Once in a while, we, we do it our way, all right? And anyway, Moses did that. And he's this great leader. God didn't do anything, right? In fact, the higher you go, the more quickly God will act. Because we said before, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It will grow, it will spread. And the leader who does it, it will spread faster. It will make people bolder to do it, right? If members do it, maybe we all hide. We hide among ourselves, we do it. But once leaders do it, we can do it in the open already. Embolden everybody to do it, correct? So God himself showed, when it comes to disobedience, I will discipline because my name sanctify me before the people. Otherwise, they will blaspheme who I am and my commandments. Alright, so God instituted it. Please know that. Please know that. And say, oh, that is Old Testament, right? Famous sayings. Old Testament. New Testament, any example? Adrian, any example? Ananias and Sapphira, yes, God stepped in to discipline. 
Um, yes, and definitely in our theme verse. Let's turn to First Timothy chapter one. In fact, First Corinthians just now also, right? First Timothy chapter one. Now, what does God say in the New Testament? Let's read verse um, 19 and 20 together. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning the faith, concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hermenius and Alexander, whom I delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to, same word, not to blaspheme. Why is discipline? And in this case, it reached a stage of excommunication. They have been warned about their false teachings. They have been warned not to put aside a good conscience. They know the truth. They know what to do. But they just keep ignoring it for various reasons. And finally, it reaches a stage where Paul says, now we have to excommunicate because if not, they may continue to blaspheme God's name. Blasphemy is always about God's name, God's honour. So please understand, the Bible is clear. Discipline is to vindicate the honour of Christ. Next, uphold the gospel profession. Uphold the godly profession of the gospel. Uphold the godly profession of the gospel. Now, when Christians don't deal with sin, when the name of God is blasphemed, how will the gospel be affected? How will the gospel be affected? Uh, Sharon. People will not believe that the God that you're sharing about to them in the gospel can really save you. Okay. Um, yes, the gospel will be affected. But will people think that Sin is serious. No. They won't think that sin is serious. After you, you don't do it, and then you are ignoring it. If sin is not serious, why do I need God? Why do I need forgiveness? Because you are doing it, I'm doing it. Why do I need this God? Because obviously you don't believe that sin is serious. Why should I take it seriously? And after all, you know, this God, I don't think He is a righteous God. Just like any other unrighteous God that I've always heard about, it's the same. Why should I fear Him? He's not going to judge sin. Now remember I shared when Kong Hee, the pastor of City Harvest, I always forget the name, the pastor of City Harvest, when he and his, his group of leaders in the church used money in ways that that are not, not legal in the eyes of the law. Did the church discipline them? Who knows the background? Not only the church did not discipline them, the church supported them. The church actually went, queue up outside the court early in the morning to go in to support their pastor and keep defending what he did, which by all accounting, the country says this is illegal. Do you know what he has done to the name of Christ in the country? I, I have relatives who say, wow, Christian, famous Christian church leaders embezzle money. Whose money? my children's money. I already told my children, don't go to the church. Church cheat you of money. And now caught by the government, the church come and defend them and say there's nothing wrong. I already told my children, don't believe in Jesus. I will never believe in this Jesus. Do you understand? If only the church stood up and said, what they did and covered up was illegal, sinful, wrong, 
not only in the eyes of the government, in the eyes of God. And if the government considers this embezzlement, this is it, we will treat it as a criminal case. We will discipline, we will deal with it because our God is a righteous God, is a holy God. Do you know what difference that will make in the country, in the world? People will say, finally, one religion that is different from every other religion. Church discipline is not only for the name of Christ, it's also for the vindicating the gospel truth. All right? So please know, if we don't deal with sin, don't talk about such heinous things. Church workers, church leaders, church members who call ourselves Christians, but are living sinful lives, carnal lives, worldly lives, no difference from the rest of the carnal, worldly, money-grabbing, covetous, um, um, worldly, desiring fame, pride, life. And then we don't do anything. So come on, please, we need to, you need to stop this. We don't deal with it. What are people going to say? Why, I lis- why do I listen to this gospel? You and I, we are the same. In fact, there was once we were at a church camp, a long time ago in my, my first church. The people, there were two churches there. One church was playing at the pool, another church, our church, we were also near there having lunch. And I heard with my own ears, parents walking past the pool. The children were scantily dressed, the, the, the church people. Boys and girls were sitting on each other's shoulders. These are teenagers and adults even. And I heard with my own ears, a, a family, uh, a, par- a couple parents walking by and said, you see, mommy, church is like that. Make sure our children don't go to church. The name of Christ is very important if you care about soul then the church must say please stop dressing like that please when we say that you must understand we love christ it's not because we hate you but it's because we love christ his honor and the gospel and that man may come to know him so please know the gospel discipline is for that purpose yes we have many things for for Look at point number three. Please look at point number three. Right, so for many things we said, there are four. But the first few was more for the people, for the church. But the last one, the, this one about the honor of Christ is to me, if you don't love Christ, then you will say church discipline is a pain. If you love Christ, you say, please tell me how I need to live. Yes, I've sinned. I'm glad you told me. I want to repent. I want to stop it. I I don't know how to stop it. Church, can you put me on discipline and help me? I want to stop it because I love my Savior and His name too much for people to blaspheme His name. And I will stop teaching and, and, and and, and keep wanting people to believe in a blasphemous doctrine. That Jesus did not, that God did not preserve his word. And other false, other erroneous doctrines that bring the name of Christ and his honor and his promises down the drain. I will not blas- I will not teach these kind of things. They're blasphemous. I love Christ too much in his name. I told you before, the Muslims mock us at all day. I say again, the Muslims mock Christianity at our outreach day in the university. They tell me to my face, your Christian scholars say that the Bible is not preserved and the things in there, some are missing already and you can never find them and they they can't be found again and and you also do not know which part, where are the errors. Your own scholars say that. Our Quran has no mistakes. Please know that if you don't love Christ, I don't care what people say about about our Bible, about God, I don't care. I still want to insist the Bible is not preserved. Even if it makes a fool out of my Savior, I don't care. But it makes me look smart. Now, next. So please know it is about the honor of Christ. Now, then the next part, the last one, which is, let's look at that. The last one. And for preventing the wrath of God, which might justly fall upon the church, if they should suffer his covenant and his seals thereof to be profaned remember again profane 
the opposite of holy, the opposite of blaspheme. Uh, the, the same as blaspheme, the opposite of holy. Profane by notorious and obstinate offenders. So now this one, preventing the wrath of God. Elisha. Elisha? Elisha, do you like daddy to cane you? Alright, no. Even a kid knows, no. <laughs> I don't like discipline. Church that does not deal with sin will be disciplined by God. We've seen many cases already, all right? Many cases already. We saw in the case of Ananias of, and Sapphira, God stepping in, and we see, um, uh, we saw Nadab and Abihu, God will step in. Now, when God steps in, it's a very, very painful thing. But even before God steps in, um, things will already happen. Now, do we want the wrath of God upon church? The question is, is it true? If church do not exercise church discipline, come on, it's not that serious. Is God really going to, going to act on us? We saw some examples. Now turn to Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. Now please look at verse 4 and 5. Joshua chapter 7, verses 4 and 5. Let's, um, all right, 3 to 5, reading. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. All right, so little, four and five. So they went up thither of the people, about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and six men, for they chased them from before the gate unto Shibarim, Shibarim and smote them at, in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Why did this happen? We all know. God says you're supposed to not keep anything from this conquer, right? But we know that someone did, Achan and the family, they did keep. Now, what happened? Let us read. So we know that it is because of that particular sin. 10 to 13, you will see. 10 to 13, eh? oh, no, not 10 to 13. Now, but any, what is the reason? What is the reason? The reason, verse 15, And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire. Whoa! Someone took the accursed thing. They're not supposed to take anything. It become accursed. And then, will be burned with fire. Now, this time God says, uh, You all act. This is the instruction. You burn them. So this is discipline. Eh? In this case, it's burn, take the family out, burn them and everything they have with fire. Discipline. Now, but I want you to notice one thing. Now, please look at verses 10 to 13. Let's read 10 to 13 together. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel have sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs upon their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Do you understand what God just told Joshua? Look at verse 10. Joshua told, hey, the Lord said to Joshua, Get thee up. Why are, you, why are you praying? He was lying down on his face. You know, those praying. Joshua, why are you still praying? Get up already. But Joshua, but we lost the battle. Of course, I've got to pray to you, right? So God says, It is not a time for praying anymore. The people have sinned. 
it is a time for acting. It is a time for discipline. Because as long as you don't discipline, I will not be with you. When the church says, hey, let's just pray. Let's just pray, right? Just pray. Just pray for him. Just pray. And don't act on discipline. Let's not do discipline. It's very unloving, very ugly, very unpleasant. We live in Mount Pleasant, right? So let's not do this kind of church discipline thing. Let's just pray. God says, My presence will not be with you. BPCWA. If one day... Now, I do not want to do discipline. I do not wish that we have. But if we need to, we will. Because we understand the reasons. But if we don't, BPCWA, you must know this. Just like God told the children of Israel, XI verse 12, you will not be able to stand before your enemies. Every spiritual battle that BPCWA tries to fight for God, everything that we try to accomplish for God, for individuals, for the church, for His name, for His gospel, for His cause, for families, everything that the church will say, let's help to build up families. We need to fight this spiritual battle. It will fail. But this is a small thing. So easy to deal with this. So easy to get the church to be more holy in this thing. So small. That's what they thought. But God says, even in the smallest thing that you want to do for me, that you want to fight for me, you will fail. Verse 12. Neither will I be with you. No point calling ourselves a church. We will just call Bible, Presbyterian. We shouldn't call Bible even. We shouldn't call Presbyterian. We should call ourselves Western Australia. That's it. Western Australia gathering. Don't call ourselves church because God is not here. No point. Don't, talk, don't call ourselves Bible because we don't obey it. So just call ourselves Western Australia congreg- congregation. That's it. So God says, because I will not be with you. Do we want to be a church where God says, you, I keep telling you, deal with sin. Deal, this thing that needs to be dealt with, deal with it. You don't want to deal with it. I will not be with you. But now, please note, God says, accept. Means there is no other condition. Accept, ye destroy the accursed among you. Then he says, verse 13, up. Up. Sanctify yourself. Up. Get up. Make yourself holy means deal with the sin. Verse 13, up, sanctify the people and sanctify yourselves. Go deal with the sin. The next day, they dealt with the sin. They burn the family. So please understand love for Christ. You don't love Christ, why do I love the church? Who cares if the church is not progressing? Let's just be nice and happy and not deal with anything. But the church exists for only one reason, that God is in our midst. He will use us for His kingdom. For his glory. So let's not call ourselves BPCWA anymore. Let's call ourselves, you know the name, Ichabod. Right? We always remember from, from Old Testament, Ichabod. God has departed, he's no longer with us. Ichabod. Alright? So those are the reasons. I hope that you are convinced by now. It is in scriptures. How does God view? How does God view not dealing and not disciplining sin? How does God view it? We just studied. Blasphemy of my name. Okay, next. You always wonder whether we'll ever reach the next point, right? Oh, before we forget. Before we forget. Now, please look at point number three. Now, notice they say preventing wrath of God. Justly so. God will be wrathful, which might justly fall upon the church. Yes, we deserve it if we don't discipline, right? Now, if they should suffer his covenant and his seals thereof to be profane. What do you think this is talking about? What do you think this is talking about? Uh, Eugene, what is this? That if we allow this, the suffer his covenant and the seals thereof to be profaned. What do, you, what, what do you think it means? What does it mean to... Sh- that if a church... Now, God's wrath should rightly fall on us, 
justly for us, if we suffer his covenant and his seals thereof to be profaned. We studied covenant and seals for many months also. <laughs> Alright, so what is it? What is what are the seals of the covenant? Can link, huh? Uh, let me try. Uh, Edda, were you here? Sign and seals of the covenant. What are they? Holy communion and water baptism. Remember? Now, the reminder here is if a church, uh, I'll put it the other way, the wrath of God should justly fall on us. We deserve it. If we allow holy communion and water baptism, to be profaned. Now do you understand why we withhold Holy Communion when a person, in some cases, when the person is under church discipline? That is the reason. If a person is under church discipline and we are still observing and the person has not shown the necessary fruit of repentance, have not proven that, or the person is still obstinate, still obstinate, as they say here, obstinate, still don't want to repent, still arguing, still fighting, so discipline is still going on. Now, if we don't withhold, and this person has committed clear sin that brought the name of Christ to shame, then we are saying, God, yeah, you know, he lived this, he did all these things, we just let him take Holy Communion. You are basically saying Holy Communion is nothing. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Alright, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, let me read to you verse, 20, um, verse 27. Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Guilty. So the church must make sure if the person has examined himself and yet is unrepentant, still committing the same sin, not willing to repent, not willing to deal with it, being disciplined, then he is partaking of the Lord's table, not discerning the Lord's body, not caring that Christ died for these very sins that he is committing and wanting to continue in and to continue to argue about, be it doctrinal teachings that are erroneous or certain lifestyle thing, certain life living thing, then he says, well, Christ shed his blood for those things, but nothing, I don't care, I don't care. Approaching the Lord's table unworthily and then the church say we must withhold we must withhold that lest he profane the covenant and the seals thereof all right so that's why we do it it's very serious if the church don't deal with it so we have to withhold it now um There is one thing that I think I cannot not cover. So I'm not sure we're going to move to the five steps ever. But I want to deal with this because when church discipline happens, something happens. I think I can deal with it in point number five as well. All right? I will ask you there. I just have to make a reminder for myself. Alright, so now we understand the reasons, okay? So I hope that you are very, very clear why the church must exercise church discipline. Now I will come to the five steps. The five steps. The five steps. Okay. 
Uh, we've done question num number 11. Now, 30.4. Let's read 30.4 together. 30.4 reading. For better attaining of these ends, the officers of the church are to proceed by admonition, suspension from the sacrament of the Lord's Supper for a season, and by excommunication from the church, according to the nature of that crime and the merit of the person. Okay, let me ask you something. Can you sit for the next 45 minutes until 9.30? Seriously? <laughs> okay. I'm not sure if you're that serious. Alright, then we do it, alright? Oh, I know why, because you don't want to <laughs> the next time we do this again. <laughs> okay, let's do it, alright? Then I'll talk fast and you answer fast. Now, who are to perform the, the official church discipline? It's very clear. The officers of the church. Who are the officers of the church? See, all these are revision. Vincent. The uh, church leaders, like deacons. And... Church leaders like deacons. Okay, try again. Yung. Say again. The elders. the elders. What were the deacons? The deacons are to carry out, but they're not supposed to right. decide. Right. The deacons execute the decisions of the officers. You go through army, I thought you understand that concept. The church officers, we've studied to death, remember. They are very careful. Look at point number two. Alright, point number one. In the hand of the church officers. Alright, and we saw the verses. It's the church elders, verse two. To these officers. Again, we studied those verses. The very thing that points to the church elders. Right? The pastor is an elder, the elder administrative administration elder is the elder. All right? So the elders, all right, Vincent, remember that. Now, so for better attaining of these ends, the officers of the church, from, from this um, document, we always know when they refer officers of the church, are the elders of the church. In other words, the group of elders of the church is called the board of elders, the BOE, right? So when you say, all right, we need to exercise church discipline, who should exercise? Huh? Uh, Vincent, gather a few of the brothers and sisters. Let's do it. No, it's the church, the BOE. So the BOE exercises, not the deacons in the session. All right, they may be involved in some in some way, but it should be exercised by the officers. Um, now, so for the be better attaining of these ends, the ends, the ends are point three to achieve point three, or the ends. These purposes of church discipline. It is best that the BOE does it. Okay? So that is um, when you see when you see the ex the communication uh, the excommunication, especially given, is given often by the apostle themselves. Okay, and done by the apostles themselves. Hmm? Now, now next thing we cover then is Um, the five steps of church censure. What are the five steps? In other words, when we say church discipline, church discipline, church discipline. Is it church discipline straight away? All right, sorry, you've committed this sin, out you go, excommunicated, that's it. Is it immediately that? There are five degrees. We go through five steps. Now look up here, uh, look in your notes. What are the five steps? Number one, Eh, did we read? Uh, we read, right? Eh, let's read point. Did we read point four? We read. Okay. Now, number one, admonition, first step. Actually, no, <laughs> it's not here. We have to go to the book, which I'll show you. But basically, they cover uh, some of the key steps: admonition, suspension. All right. So now here they talk about the Lord's Supper only and by excommunication. Then final step. Now, the Bible Presbyterian Presbytery has always had a book of discipline which if I know to use this laptop and you respond to me I'll show you all right this is you can download this from the internet just type BP book of discipline right so this is the cover 
There are various sections which we won't cover. They will explain the nature and the reason for discipline. We've, we've studied all those. All right, we jump straight to and many legal terms and all that there, proper trials and all that. But we jump straight to the section where they talk about the section where they talk about censure, censure and restoration. All right, so what do we do in censure and restoration? Big enough? Very big, right? Okay. Censure and uh, restoration. Discipline and for restoring the person. Now, in judicial discipline, there are five degrees of censure. Five steps. Five stages of severity. All right? That's why they call it degrees. Five steps and five stages of severity. It begins with admonition, A. Then rebuke. Then it moves to the next step. Now, it works like that. It means you admonish, but the person won't repent. Then you need to move to the next step of severity, rebuke. Then still incalcitrant and unrepentant, or repent and then do it again, and again, or do it secretly. Then it goes to rebuke, then goes to, then still the same, then goes to suspension, then goes to deposition. And then finally, the last and the most severe step is excommunication. Okay, five steps. So, I know you have been trying to find out what are the five steps. These are the five steps. Okay, now, what do, does each mean? So, first step, admonition. Admonition means tenderly, solemnly, so very tenderly. Very loving, very ten every step is lovingly, right? Tenderly means in a tender tone, in a tender tone, in a pleading tone, and solemnly, not jokingly. This is serious. Not, hey, don't do that. Ah, it will be good. Ah. Not like that. It's solemn, means the person has to know it's serious. It's not a joking matter anymore. Solemnly addressing the offender, placing his sin before him. You have to show him, this is sin, brother, sister. Warning him of his danger and exhorting him to repentance with greater fidelity to the Lord Jesus. Great if the person, you plead with the person and the person knows they're serious and then the person say, you know, thank you for warning me. Yeah. I know, I know if I continue in this relationship, I continue in this sin, I continue doing this, I continue, yeah, I'm in danger. God himself will, will discipline me. I want, I'll repent and want to turn back to Christ and want to be even more faithful to him now. Great. What has happened? You have won the brother, correct? You have won the brother. Now, in fact, let's turn to Matthew. The principle is here, Matthew. Matthew chapter 18. So it is not the. F okay, Matthew chapter 18. Now. Sixteen, right? Eighteen, correct. I was looking at the wrong place. Matthew chapter eighteen. Now, verse fifteen. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, so it can be a personal sin, or it can be a public sin. All right. Go and tell him his fault between thee and him. If he hear, you have gained. So you go and admonish him. Admonish him. So notice Christ's instruction was not straight away, verse not straight away, um, verse 17. If you don't hear you, then you know, consider him a, a heathen, cast him out of church. No. There was this admonition, pleading, reasoning, showing him his sin. Now, is this only to be done by the church officers? Admonition not necessary. Alright? Admonition can be anybody. You all, too, right? So you can also admonish. It's everybody's duty to admonish. 
Now, but I want to say here, this is not a blanket encouragement and endorsement. Let's now start admonishing one another. Because if not, God is displeased. Remember the principle. Make sure that you're not, so, you're not trying to remove the beam from your brother's eyes when you have the moat in your eyes, right? Actually, what's the meaning of that? means don't talk to your brother. Don't show him, I got moat. Wow, he got a big beam, you know, but I better not. And even Christ tell me not to do it. What's the meaning of that? Uh, I forgot when I asked. Uh, Sarah, what do you think that means when Christ said, okay, no time for question. That point is simply this. God is simply saying, when you go and tell your brother his sin, make sure your motives are true. Make sure that you are not hypocritical, proud. Check your own self as well. Alright? Because here God says, if your brother trespass against you, go and talk to him. God did not say you cannot talk to people with a beam in their eyes. But say, make sure you know the mold in your own eyes. Talk to him with that understanding. Not just going out to attack. Because all of us, do you think all of us have some beam in our eyes? Every single one of us. Then all of a sudden, after this, everyone going down to do the A. You know what's a five step? A, I can do, you know, I don't have to wait for the officer to do, you know. Let's all start doing it. This is not what we're talking about, all right? So, but when we know, yes, we should. We should admonish. We should admonish tenderly. Now, then the, now if the person refuses to repent, hey, you know, brother, you know this thing that you, that you are portraying all the time, that you're doing all the time, is sinful. And the brother say, um, I don't agree with you. Then it becomes a problem. Then you may need to now be brought to, Matthew 18, now brought to witnesses, correct? Brought to witnesses. And with the witnesses, now you have to go to rebuke. It could be bring up to church leaders, and then church leaders now go to the present with witnesses that the person has committed that sin and is unrepentant. And then it comes to rebuke. Let's look. Re okay. Rebuke is a form of censure more severe than admonition. It consists in setting forth the serious character of the offence, reproving the offender, exhorting him to repentance and more perfect fidelity to Christ. Now it's more severe. Now it is scolding, in other words. Very serious now. Okay? Now, what happens, for example, I, give you, I can think of examples like, you go and tell the brother, brother, please don't do this. The brother or sister is about to do something. They say, you know, this is sinful. Then you tell the person. And then the person listens to you. Okay, what happens if it is this? The person listens to you. Terry, thank you for telling me that. You know, I was about to do this. We were about to do it as a family or as an individual. But Terry, thank God, God sent you and, you know, you're right, we, we shouldn't go ahead with this. Alright? And then one month later, Terry finds out that they or he or she went ahead with it anyway. Terry, what are you going to do? Go back to the person and ask why. And then the person say, uh, don't answer you and just can't be bothered. What are you going to do next? Then it's a grievous sin. Bring two or three witnesses. Alright? Bring two or three witnesses. Then in, now because it's, it's, I say I will repent but I don't and I went ahead to do it, it also goes to the next step. It's not, anyway, he's, he, felt repent, he felt sorry and, but he eventually did, but he did feel sorry so it's alright. No, it moves on to the next step, rebuke. Understand that? It moves to rebuke. So the person went ahead to do it or the person refused to listen to you in the first step, then witnesses. Now what witnesses can there be? What kind of witnesses? What do you think? One kind of witnesses is the person also saw. The person also saw what the person did. That is one kind of witness. The other kind of witness is the person um, knows about the case and is willing to go with you to talk about it. May not be directly involved, but is willing to be a witness that when you go and talk to the person and we are dealing with this, we will come with you. Now, example is for example. 
there's a church discipline case all right then i will have to deal with it talk to the admonish the person the person refused to repent or the person say yes 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 but continue to do it in the end then i need witnesses then i'll call reverend paul is reverend paul present at here what the person did then no but i need him as a witness i say reverend paul now i need to move to rebuke and here are all the documents here are all the things and then we will be in teleconference with this person all right or sometimes i may call the deacons in as witnesses present all right then it goes to those witnesses because you're moving to rebuke now now what other kind of witnesses are possible today is an age of technology what other kind of witnesses <laughs> what, what mean facebook? facebook pictures on facebook pictures on facebook what do you mean by that they go to some places that they shouldn't do Oh, okay. So they did something or they went somewhere or they, they did something and then they put it on their Facebook. Yes, that's one example. So that's live witnesses. You got, unless, you, do you change your, your face? It's your face. How can you say no? It's your face. Okay, that's, that's, I think that's a good example. But I was thinking of, for example, it can be, witnesses can be recordings. All right, so sometimes in some meetings, we put recorders. Say so this will be, from here onwards, it will be our witness. What you say, what I say, everything recorded. I'm thinking of that kind of technology. All right, our Facebook, I think it is, now actually to think about it, Facebook is one of the worst things that the Christian can use to blaspheme the name of Christ and bring the standards and Christ's name to shame. You agree? You agree? Why do you agree? <laughs> no one else agrees. They're all quiet. Why do you agree, Valerie? Because we like so that we can set arguing people wrong impression of what supposed to be in the Because we like certain things that that make people think this is what Christians are about and what God is about. And we go and like it. You know what like, right? The thumbs up and all that. You see something and then you like it. But that is, not some, that is something that brings the name of Christ to shame. And then you go thumbs up. Or worse. Like Yong said, you go and paste your own and then you thumbs up your own. In your own Facebook. It's the most dangerous thing. Christians, please be very careful. I'm not saying you just do it behind and don't show anybody. But I'm saying, please, when we post things and all that, think. Not only in your personal work, you must be very pure and holy. But the worst thing you can do is you post it and make people think that that is what Christians and that is what Christianity and the standard of Christ is supposed to be. Now I remember, along this way I can show you verses, right? Now, let's turn to... Okay, let's turn to First uh, Thessalonians five twenty two. First Thessalonians five twenty two. Now, sometimes, how can you admonish a brother? You show the brother, show him his sin, right? How to show him his sin? Use scriptures to show him his sin. So we are admonition. Huh? First Thessalonians five twenty two. Can we read together? First Thessalonians five twenty two one two reading. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Brother, what you're posting or what you're doing, what you're showing people or what you're intending to get into, have all the appearance of evil. They are going to bring the name of Christ to shame. Don't do it. Right? So that's one example. Um, let's also... Turn to an example. Um, I think I'll use that example for later. Oh no, let's use it. Second Timothy chapter two nineteen. Just the next book, Second Timothy chapter two, verse nineteen.
Okay, let's read together. Uh, I'm wrong. Okay, one, two, reading. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. As long as you name the name of Christ, means what? You call yourself Christian. You take on Christ's name for yourself. I'm a Christian. Anyone that name the name of Christ, let him depart from iniquity because it will bring the name of Christ to shame. Like I told you many times, unbelievers say, Christians are like that. I don't want my daughter to look like her. I don't want my daughter to do those things with boys. I don't want my, my son to behave like that. The name of Christ and his gospel is at stake. So when people admonish us, now, and this is what you can use to admonish someone. They say, yes, for greater fidelity to Christ, I repent. I won't do it. I won't do it. But if you don't love Christ, you say, get lost. Mind your own business. I don't love Christ. All right, so then you move to the next form, rebuke. Rebuke. Now, rebuke would be done by officers already. Now you bring it to the next level. Church leaders get involved. The, the pastor, the elders, they get involved. They may involve other people. And then they're going to sit down and have a meeting with you. And then they will bring out um, um, proofs and all that. And then there will be a formal rebuke. Now then, these things will be recorded. Like I say, I, I like to use voice recorder. So there's no argument about it. All right, so I will always tell people, we are going to voice record this meeting. Because we do not want, later on, you say, I say. You misunderstand, I misunderstand. I did not say. That was not what I meant. Many of these things. I've been in, through enough of that. Because people say, minute it. I say, we will minute it. In some cases, I will minute it. And I will minute it. But I still tell people, the recorder will be there. Because if one day, you come back and you disagree, that in this discipline, we were not fair to you, for example, and you say, we didn't do this, we didn't do that, instead we did this, we did that, and our minute don't reflect that, we pull out our minute, our recording, and then we all listen to it, right? Yes, maybe I minuted it wrongly, then I am wrong. But if I minuted it correctly, then let's come to the agreement, you said it, we did do this, or we did not do that, that you said we did, right? <laughs> then it's all clear, right? So, now, this is the same as what happens outside in the world, right? Your boss calls you up. Mabel nodded, hey, you got discipline at work. No, I don't think so. Mabel is loved at work. Your boss say, right, we've got to deal with... Those of you who have worked in human resource, you know. We will rec we record, we will document everything properly. All right? So that is, is good for the person, it's good for the church. So each one will, will, will be told that this is what, what will happen. Now, hopefully... At this point, the person says, yes, you know, this is really serious. Church leaders got involved. I've been shown from scriptures. I've, I've, I've put Christ's name to shame publicly um, in this decision or in, in, in this posting or in this, in this uh, choice. Then um, I repent. Now, at this stage, what do we do? Hunky-dory, close, move on. What do you think? How do we know the person has really repented? Because there are three kinds of repentance, right? One is unrepentant. Means just, just deny outright, I don't believe it's sin, I, I'm continuing to teach this doctrine. Two, or, or, leave, or make that choice, continue to leave that post on and not take it down. Now, I've told some of people to remove their posts from Facebook before because it is... In fact, I, I didn't know about it. Uh, when I first arrived, yeah, someone sent me a, a posting of one of our church people's Facebook photo. And they say, you know, Reverend Joseph, this is your church person's posting. And I said, okay. Well, it's not good. So I did write to the person and say, these are the reasons 
it will bring the name of Christ to shame. It will also encourage others who see that photo in the Facebook of yours to think, to think that that is fine and they will also do it themselves and with their family. So the, I think the person removed. And that's it. Repentant. All right. Say, yeah, but, but Reverend Joseph, I agree with you. You will encourage other people to do same thing. Same thing. And that's it. Done. Now, so then there is the repentant. Right? So there's the repentant. So the unrepentant, the repentant. And then what do you think is the third kind? Say again? Yeah. The false repentant. The false one. Means outwardly repent, say all the right things, but you don't know whether the person is genuine. Can, can we know? Don't know. Or false repentant can be yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to. Don't worry, don't worry. Thank you, thank you, Terry. Thanks, thanks. But behind, they are going to do it anyway. All right? So that's the false repentance after admonition. So do you think I rebuke if the person, yes, 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 I'm repentant, yes. Then we say, okay, all done, close case. Let's move on. Well done. Let's go, cof- Let's go for coffee now. Should we? Uh, Shalin, should we? No? So unforgiving, you. What will you do? Follow up. There is follow up, keeping track of the person's profession of repentance. Alright? So at this stage, we will also typically put in certain actions. Observe the person for a period. Certain things the person, we say, go read this scriptures go read this book for example if the person is is um, is is caught lying seriously lying seriously is this a non-serious lie i don't know but committed lying and can't keep lying say okay go read this book about lying read these scriptures about lying or go find all the scriptures about lying in the bible and then go and write a paper on it you know why right so that as the people read scriptures, if you're a believer, a genuine believer, you read scriptures, you'll be convicted. Then you write, it reinforces, and say here is the paper, and then we read. Yeah, this person really understands that it is a sin to lie. He really understands from the paper he writes, it makes, it shows that he, no. Is it over? No. Then we continue to observe certain things. Now, these are set of action, the things that you must do. What are the things? Keep coming to church. For the next say eight months every fellowship meeting unless there's reason valid reason you must be in church why eh? why do you think so douglas why should we say that Sorry. oh the question is why must we tell the person for example one of the action be a prayer meeting bible studies fellowship now of course worship um, for at least six months consistently Prove the repentance. But the person can come here and just... <laughs> right? The, yes. Hear the discipline from the pulpit. In other words, the, keep coming to hear the Word of God. Keep coming to hear the Word of God. In fact, very often, many of us fall into sin because we don't have enough of the Word of God in our lives. If you're a true believer and you're truly repentant, you will receive the Word of God and you keep learning new things about God, new things about the Christian walk, your faith, your life, your spiritual growth will begin to grow. Right? So we ask them to come not because if you're not here Tuesday night, maybe you're out doing something wrong. Of course, there's, there is a good thing to, to do for, but definitely it's more for learning. Alright? So come for period and so on. So there are things that we do and then we meet Regularly, a certain time frame, we say we'll meet and then we review. Have you done this thing again? No, I have not. Or a person say, Yes, I have. And say, All right, then now we have to take on more stringent actions. All right, but the person is repentant. But over time, you begin to realize that the person is, is growing unrepentant, or you discover for more and more false repentance. Then it gets worse. If the person genuinely repents and over a period show the fruit of repentance, well, then at step two, you can close it after some time. There will be a review. 
and then close. But if not, then it moves to next step. Suspension. What is suspension? Suspension is a form of censure by which one is deprived of the privilege of communication, of communicant membership in the church, from office or from both. It may be for a definite or indefinite time. Okay, just stop here first. So now suspension. In other words, now the person will be deprived of, for example, Holy Communion. All right? So suspended from Holy Communion. And then, now depending on the nature of sin, in re- at the stage of rebuke, there is sometimes the need to also suspend Holy Communion. Okay, until we really see the person is genuinely repentant. Now, so then, and also not only from that, but also from office. From office. In other words, if the person is serving in certain ministry, in certain capacity in church, fellowship lead, um, um, deacon, elder, um, um, and so on, then the person will be removed from office. Or you can be uh, so someone serving in a prominent role in something. All right? You will be removed. Asked to step down. Asked to step down. Maybe for a definite or indefinite time. Okay, so depends on the nature of the sin, severity of the sin, um, um, signs of um, remorse and repentance, then another set of period happens. Okay, suspension. Now, in suspension, I ask you some questions. Uh, now, some of the questions I ask you now, look at the next part. It may be for, uh, sorry, suspension of an officer from the communion of the church shall, be always be accom- shall always be accompanied with suspension from office. Now, if we suspend you from Holy Communion, for example, then those who are suspended from Holy Communion will definitely be suspended from the ministry work. But if you are suspended from the ministry work, it does not necessarily mean that we will suspend, we need to suspend you from Holy Communion. Okay? So that's how the discipline works, which I think makes sense. In other words, a person who is um, 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 serving has shown um, repentance and so on um, is different. Alright? So those that are Suspended for Holy Communion will definitely be suspended from office. So we won't have a case, you can't take Holy Communion, you continue to be serving prominently in the ministry. You'll be asked to step down. Okay, so, so that. Now, again, if the person is unrepentant, in other words, or example, the elder, or deacon, or a ministry lead, the child marry unbeliever. You advise, you what? No, I'm still going, I'm still going. No, uh, I'm not going to um, ignore the warning. Then the person will be suspended from office. Okay? Now, actually, very often this this whole thing becomes very ugly. Friends will leave. Um, Friends or people being disciplined will leave. Very often. Okay. All right, so suspension. So now, at suspension, if the person still is unrepentant, then, um, all right, during suspension, what is a person supposed to go through? Point six. An, an office bearer or communicant member, so not just leaders, huh? ordinary members, communicant members church member in the church, while under suspension, what are they supposed to do? Shall be, um, shall be the object of deep solicitude and earnest dealing to the end that he may be restored. When the trial of a cop, uh, okay, so the whole situation now is very serious. It is no laughing matter with the person anymore. Now, the person who is now announced to be under suspension or has been barred from Holy Communion, there is the need for deep solicitude and earnest dealings. 
both the person himself or herself and the church with the person. So this person who is going through suspension, in other words, for example, you say, all right, you're suspended. And then the person go around like nothing, um, like nothing is happening. Uh, like doing what? I don't know. Doing what? Ben, 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 doing what? Like nothing is wrong. All right, so no, but from Holy Communion, act in church like as if nothing, you know, it's, it's just flaunting. Um, having fun, um, um, holidaying, um, going on, hey, let's go eat, uh, come on, let's go. As if, maybe I put it this way. All right, Howard, when your son is very naughty, then you admonish, then you rebuke already, then still very naughty, then now you, 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 you cane already, and what we normally say, go to your Go to your room. Why you ask your kid to go to your room? Why you ask your kid to go to the room? You don't do that. <laughs> when you're young, your parents say, you go to your room. Do what? Valerie laughing. Do what? Go and reflect. No, no, go to your room and play computer games. Go to your room and play computer games. <laughs> and sleep. Go to your room and reflect. Why room? You quietly sit there and you think of what you've been doing and think of what you have done. Go and look at yourself in the mirror. Go and sit in the corner and look at the wall and think about it. Right? So it's a time for both the church and the person, especially the person under that. Now if the person act like there's nothing wrong. Alright, so those of us who go through this kind of thing, huh? after all this serious thing that happened to us at home, and then we still go around laughing and act, playing the joker. And then parents say, okay, we are going to McDonald's. Okay, I'm going. What happens going about going to McDonald's? No, you stay at home. Right? You don't get to go. You don't get to... That, uh, Daddy, my, my school is going on a holiday trip. All right? I'm going, uh, give me money, I'm going to. He said, no, you're not going until you repent, until you start thinking about, what, think seriously about what you do and I see some change in you. You're not going. Understand that, all right? So this is, if a person does not show anything, still go around asking, I want to go here, I want to, go, I want to do this in church. It shows that the person doesn't understand the severity of the sin. Understand that, right? Even parents will say that. Look, seriously, I don't think you're serious. <laughs> Correct? You're not serious about this at all. So, now if we reach the stage, still like that. And also unrepentant. Now, hopefully repent. Next, you say, when the trial of the court. So now, now there are proper trials already. There's the rebuke, there's the meeting, there is the recording, there is the warning, and there may be a few of it. And then review, you did it again. Now, next. So person may be suspended. Now the next thing. The pers- uh, so, now, if the person repents, that's great. While the trial of the court pronounces the censure is satisfied of the pen- penitence of the offender, and when the time of suspension has expired, no new offence has arisen, censure shall be removed, and the offender shall be restored. This restoration shall be accompanied with solemn admonition. Restoration to the privileges of common communion may take place without restoration to the office. Okay, so now, this is opposite now. Now, if the person repents, how do you know one other thing? That is, the church might be satisfied with the penitence of the offender, not still frivolous, not still, still like as if nothing is happening, still having fun. Um, and when no new offense has arisen, that's important. We always ask, have you done it again? Have you done something else that we need to know about? The thing that we told you not to do, have you really not done it? So all those things. Then if it's sufficiently proven, then restoration, which is good. Then great. But even the restoration, there's solemn admonition. Don't do it again. Very serious. All right, it's not, hey, let's go. All right, restored already. Let's go for, let's go for a steak dinner. There's still very serious. Now you go back and thank the Lord that you've been delivered. There's still a serious admonition. Don't do it again. Now, if unrepentant, in other words, the person is under suspension. You're not allowed to serve in these ministries anymore. 
because you have shown, you have said you won't do it, you went ahead to do it. You said that you didn't do it, but you actually did it. You said that um, you will stop, but you continued to go ahead with it. We, we, talk, we say that you will take it down your Facebook, but you don't. Now you think that there is such things? Uh, actually, I lost my question sheet. Can I borrow? Because I want to follow this. Um, Oh, no, it's not here. But I want to ask this question. Because someone asked me, uh, which, which is a very good question. Sorry. Can I borrow? Leave it here. Um, someone asked me. No, actually, we're not going to finish this. <laughs> but someone asked, how, how do we know that the person has repented? How do you know? How do you know? How do you know that at a meeting, the person cry and the person say I won't do it again I denounce everything that I believe that are, that are wrong you've shown me I believe and I denounce all of it uh, I don't believe it anymore and I won't ask people to believe it anymore or um, I, I, I really know that I'm wrong uh, please forgive me now we had a recent case like that all the things said but how do I know that we need to move from rebuke to suspension. How do I know? Actually, Young, you brought a good point. Facebook. That's how I found out. So the person said, Pastor, please forgive me. You know, I'm so thankful that you're so patient. You forgive me so many times. And um, uh, I denounce. The person said, I denounce and renounce everything that I've said before. I don't believe it anymore. You know? Um, Will you forgive me? I say, we will always forgive you. I ask the next time. When we come back, right? We can't finish. We can come back. So Christ asks us to forgive 70 times 7 times, right? What does it mean? So no, no church discipline should not move to the next step. What does it mean? How do we handle that? And then the next thing I found out is the person posted on the Facebook again. The person said, I will not. I don't believe. But did it again that is why then the person moved from rebuke now to suspension now we have to take you off the ministry that we have put you in in church we have to remove you because it's proven that you're not repentant all right okay so now the person is in suspension now after suspension if the person is unrepentant, so during suspension, yes, yes, I don't do it anymore, but actually continues to be the same. Then it moves to the next, deposition. Deposition of an officer consists of depriving him permanently of the exercise of his office and may follow upon conviction, conviction of and may follow upon conviction of heresy or gross immorality. In other words, if you are serving in church, you will be asked to move out of your position permanently. Suspension is temporary. By the word, it means temporary, right? Temporary. But if still continue to be unrepentant, you say you do, but uh, yeah, other evidences and witnesses show that you don't, then now is no more suspension. The suspension now moves to, sorry, you have to permanently step out of this role forever. All right? So it moves to the next step. It moves to the next step. Now, at every step, I make it a point to tell the person, this meeting is an admonition meeting. Let me record it. Then, the person don't repent. Or repent and continue to do it. Say repent and continue to do it. Next meeting, I say, please know this meeting is a rebuke meeting now. Huh? Eugene, you remember? I told the person now, I need the person to be clear. This is no longer admonition. This is a rebuke meeting. Because now, if after the rebuke meeting and you continue, and we recorded all this and say you won't, you won't, and you will change and you continue, then know that this is rebuke. And have no second thoughts that after this rebuke, 
and you are unrepentant, we are moving to the next step, which is we will tell you to stop serving in church, in the ministry you are doing, temporarily at least. So the person no. So the person won't say, but you, you didn't tell me what. Hmm? So the person knows. Now, actually, even, even the person don't know, what does it mean? The next time we come back, I'll ask you. The person say, I didn't know. Then how? Now anyway, let's keep on this. So the next one is depose. Permanently move out. If, now, look at this. And may, point seven, may follow upon conviction of heresy or gross immorality. May follow upon conviction of heresy or gross immorality means this. It means if it is, you're convicted of heresy, means it's proven heresy. Against, contrary to the obvious teachings of the Word of God, heresy. Or gross immorality means fornication, molesting someone, gross immorality. All right? In these cases, deposition can follow immediately upon conviction. Do you understand? Means there's no A, A, you should not have molested the child. Talk tenderly to the person and convince. No such thing. Don't, no such thing as we are going to rebuke you first, alright? Then I just remember, we still need to go through suspension, then we can move to depose. No such thing. Convicted, proven heresy, gross immorality, the church can immediately say depose. Means fired from your position. Full stop. Alright? So there are these cases. Now, but I have to ask you this question. We should come and answer the next time. Which will be so long ago, so long later, you do not remember anything. But I want to ask you, if I need someone to step down from church service, does it mean that all cases are discipline, disciplinary cases? Not necessary. All right? Not necessary. Why? We come back to that. All right? So at least we know that position, then after that, still won't repent. I've been deposed. And I'm still in calcitrant. I still teach. I still try and convince people of false doctrines, or I continue to cause problems in the church with my ways and all that, still unrepentant. Instead of solicitude and repent, I continue to be defiant, go around the problem. Then the church now have to protect the church, right? Then it goes to E, excommunication. It's the most severe form of censure and is resorted to only in case of peculiar aggravation and persistent impenitence. Right? So it is not a light step. It consists in solemnly excluding the offender from the communion of the visible church of Jesus Christ. Means you are no longer in the local church. That is what it means. Alright? So the five steps. You know the five steps now. The next time we come back, we will go into some details and some technical um, questions which some people ask, which are very, very good um, questions um, for us to understand. All right, so one more minute. Any urgent question about tonight that I can clarify? No? Sorry, we did not manage to finish. Let's turn to God in prayer. Now, someone asked, what is the difference between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Someone also asked, can we just have instrumental music? Can, can we worship God with instrumental music?